Hello everybody and welcome to another another art lecture stream uh, by me, Iothisk, uh, brought to you by the R4A Art School subreddit Discord. Today's topic is comic strips. We're gonna cover uh, we're gonna cover a number of things when it comes to uh, creating comic strips. So the the main four things that we'll be covering today. Um, well, we'll be we'll be covering the terminology and uh, and a couple of tips for each term. Uh, we're going to be covering writing. We're going to cover drawing. We're going to cover lettering, uh, and we'll if we got time, we'll cover publishing a bit. But uh, yeah, that's a that's a term all its own. But yeah, so let's go ahead and uh, and get started. So let's see here. I'm going to. I'm going to switch over to this one. All right. So first off, we're going to cover terminology. Terminology. We're going to cover the anatomy of a comic. So right here, I've got kind of a setup. For a, for a strip comic here. You know, uh, things laid out in this format are, are strip comics. Things can also be laid out in page format. Those would be called comic pages. So strips are usually published in newspapers, of course, but yeah. So let me cover the different parts of the comic page. So uh, right here, this, so these entire spaces, all of these are called panels. Panels. All of these are panels. Um, so these, these are, yeah, so they're usually enclosed by a border. Uh, that's not always the case. Some panels uh, can be, can be called breakaway panels. Uh, in which, you know, if there's a character kind of like jumping up or like reaching over into another panel to like grab something um, or or something like that, uh, those those are called those are called breakaway panels. Oops. I'm drawing right over my board here. Let's go. Sorry, let me turn this over for just a sec. Not turn this over. I'm making a new layer. All right. So each of these are called panels. Pages contain panels. Panels contain subjects of the comic and uh, and the words. So there's word balloons, which are going to be captured in a shape kind of like this. And the word balloons will usually have a tail pointing to someone. Uh, word balloons are not the only words you'll find in comics, obviously. So there will also be, um, let's see here. Refer back to my notes, as always. All right. Um, yeah, so they'll contain word balloons. They'll contain sometimes caption. Captions? Nah. Yeah. The captions are a narration box, usually along the upper left side, but they can break away into the panel itself if the captions are needed. Such are more typically found in uh, page comics and comic books. You won't typically find captions on, on strips unless it's uh, necessary that a uh, that a significant amount of time pass or something like that. But that can be shown in other ways too. But yeah, so panels contain your subject, whoever your person is, the uh, word balloons, they can have captions, they can have sound effects, or onomatopoeias if you want to be super specific. Or if you want to sound super fancy, they're called onomatopoeias, but most of the time we just call them sound effects. 
Uh, so other times, so other other notes, other things that that you should know is that these uh, there there will be sometimes like little uh, symbols and and the like around the character. Uh, this is a this is a term that was invented by the uh, the artist of uh, the Beetle Bailey comics. So kind of old, but he invented the term Grolix. And the Grolix are like sometimes a little sweat beads that'll shoot off of like a comic book character or these little, uh, no, excuse me, sorry, I'm confusing my terms here. So Grolix, let me, let me cover it first since I mentioned it first. Grolix is whenever a character uses uh, symbols in their speech that would otherwise be uh, swear words or something like that. <laughs> yeah, they'll usually shout it out. But that's got a term. It's called Grolix. <laughs> or it's just called the symbols. We're speaking in symbols because our comic can't swear for whatever reason. But we need to make sure that they have an expletive. Whereas these little marks over here that I make, their term is emanata. And they're called emanata because they emanate from a character. So this character is feeling a lot of different things like, you know, like they got surprise. Oops. And these are not like part of like the the drawing of the character itself. These are things that kind of emanate from the character, hence the term emanata. And it can be all sorts of things. They can, you know, like be a little be a little dizzy with a squiggle or they'll be surprised with that or they'll have uh other marks like that uh or marks showing movement like if there's suddenly brought up their finger to point at something and there are like those little motion marks, those can be considered that too. But yeah, so there's there's all these little things, those are those are called emanata. And Grolix is the the swears, the, the censored swear words. So yeah. So those are panels, panel borders. Oh, between so there panels typically have borders, sometimes that they sometimes they don't. You know the the borders are the obviously these uh, boxes along them, uh, and those kind of contain the action. Um, they don't necessarily always have to, uh, but yeah. So sometimes there'll be there'll be breakaway panels, and then the, so they're the panel borders, and then this space in between is called the gutters. So they're gutter spaces. So you've got your panels, your gutters, and another and other panels. And uh, it's a good idea to maintain consistency all throughout. So here, things haven't been kept the most consistent. I think our, my boxes here got a little bigger as I went along. It's not a, a huge thing, but like the more consistent and clean your comic looks, the more professional it will come off. So. You've got your panels with your borders. You got gutters. Uh, let's see here. What else do I have here? Yeah, the Grolix and the Emanata. Yeah. So I mean, those are those are the terms covering like the 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 page itself, the panel itself. Um, yeah, and there'll be more terms headed headed forward as I uh, as I cover more things. But yeah, do I have any questions so far? Feel free to type them in the stream chat. Okay, cool. If none so far, then I will go ahead and, and move on. So that's that's some terminology. Hopefully you find that useful. Uh, yeah. All right. So on the art side. Yep, that's good. That's That's at least some of the art side. We'll return to more of the art side a little bit later. Uh, as far as for making choices as to what your panels should contain, uh, because those will those will be choices. But first off, you want to make sure that you are writing the story well. And so for writing, we're going to cover 
we're going to cover writing narrative structures. So let me go ahead and write this down. Writing narrative structure. Okay, and the narrative structure, um, I'm going to take it in a, there's, there's, I'm, I'm combining a few different things here. But hopefully, if you've ever taken like a writing course or a writing class, um, you can find that one way to break down writing structure is into acts. So that's typically three act or four act structure. So when you're writing your scripts, you want to, um, sometimes you do want to keep your structure in mind. Like, th there are all kinds of ways that people write, write comics. You know, sometimes the writing comics actually begins with, like, a really cool image that they drew. Or something like, you know, a superhero flying through the air. Or something like that. It'll be like, oh, hey, you know what, I want to make this into a into a story and so like it can it can start from an image or something like that but generally um, the 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 type of story and the type of story that I'm that I'm doing right here there there are a couple different types of stories but what I'm mainly focused on here uh, is something called the the arch plot and there are there are stories with plot and there are stories without plot uh, and they those could be considered like art films or like concept comics or something like that experimental type of stuff but yeah I'm covering specifically narrative structure and arch plot type of thing so um, and why is this why is this important when it comes to strip comics well let me show you an example of someone who is kind of a master of three act structure this is Bill Watterson's comic, Calvin of Hobbes. And you can kind of see... We'll go up in here. So if I'm breaking things down into three-act structure, your first act is usually your um, exposition. Uh, it establishes characters. Uh, it establishes a, a course for the, for the entire story to kind of go off of. So when you're breaking, when you're breaking uh, down comics, you know, into into act structure, they can follow this type of thing, right? And so we've got act one. And what are we doing in this panel? We're establishing a character, uh, a couple of characters, and we're establishing a scene and some action. Uh, and they got uh, they got some props here as well. You got the dad washing his car here, and you've got the little kid Calvin wearing a, a safari looking cap right here. That's clarified in the in the next part. Um, so yeah, so we establish characters. Caracatus. Establish characters. Setting. Um, yeah, so you're establishing the characters and the setting, the time and place. Like, what exactly is going on here? We've got a dad washing his car. So obviously, you know, this isn't set in the medieval period or something like that. There are clues as to, like, a time period or what's going on here. So we've got a dad washing his car and their little kid right here. Um, so, like, from, from just the image alone, if we, if we didn't have, like, the word balloon necessarily, we would see, you know, this this adult man and then this little child here. Um, but yeah, but the words add to that, right? So he says, so long, Pop, I'm off to check my tiger trap. So we establish characters, we have a setting, uh, and we have a, a, a situation. The setting and the situation kind of, kind of combine. So, so in Act 1, we've established characters, we have established our setting and our situation. And then in Act 2, Act 2 is typically the longest uh, part of any story. 
So, in, like, in a strip comic, it's going to contain, like, uh, an... So, like, the, the, border bet the borders between Act 1 and 2 typically will contain something called an inciting incident. Inciting... Incident. And what's the inciting incident here that uh, changes the world uh, or where the, or the character's direction uh, from you know their ordinary living circumstances into something in an extraordinary living uh, extraordinary circumstance? He says, "So long, Pop. I'm off to check my tiger trap." And so you know, like, oh, you know, little kids shouldn't be actually setting up a tiger trap. Something something's going on here, right? Uh, rigged a tuna fish sandwich yesterday, so I'm sure to have a tiger by now. Callan says, "So, this is this is uh this is part of continuing setup. There's an inciting incident. Calvin has decided to do something, and he explains his methods. So, this is um this is still part of where the lines can blur a little bit. So we're esta still establishing kind of the situation in the beginning of of Act of Act Two here, uh, and that's totally fine. Um." If it if it bleeds over a little, because they can the lines can blur here, especially when you're dealing with such a small format of uh, of storytelling here. So in Act Two, the the situations escalate. The situations escalate. So how does the situation escalate from, from the later part of Act 2? So the dad says, hey, they like tuna fish, huh? So he's questioning what's exactly happening with, with Calvin, and Calvin explains, tigers will do anything for a tuna fish sandwich. So the situation has escalated. The father has, like, provided, you know, provided some sort of, like, re resistance or conflict. resistance conflict that the character has to confront or or deal with somehow and so like this isn't this isn't something like Calvin's super interested in like making a, a conversation about or having an argument about neither of them are super interested uh, so the so the the conflict here is fairly easily uh, dis, uh, uh, fairly easily resolved so, Act 2 will also, uh, the situations escalate, there will be a resistance and a conflict, and there will be, uh, let's see here, there will also contain, like, a, a final conflict, and then the end of that final conflict will typically be the climax of a story. And that will be kind of the in-between place between, you know, Act 1 has the inciting incident to Act inciting incident. Uh, everything following the inciting incident is Act 2. All of these things happen. Uh, situations escalate. There's a final cl conflict and a climax is is the, the very tip of all, all of that uh, emotional excitement. And then over here, we can finish it out with Act 3. There's a resolution. So there's the result of all, of all of this, so to speak. So Calvin set out to capture a tiger. He explained how he was going to do it. His pop doesn't really believe he's going to do it, but he's off to do it anyway. Uh, the the uh, the conflict and resistance has been met. He's off to check his trap. And he's checking off, and Hobbs is up there, stuck in the trap, and says, we're kind of stupid that way. So, resolution, so there's there's been establishment of characters, setting situation, act two, the situations escalate, uh, our our hero, so to speak, Calvin, has met resistance and conflict, and there's a, there's a final conflict and a resolution, so there's a resolution to this entire thing, and then there's the outcome. Outcome to the whole thing in the resolution. So, you know, this this isn't like typical, but this you can see that there's a that there's a 
This isn't typically how you think of like act structures because you're typically thinking long form like a play or or a, or a book, you know, sometimes. You aren't typically thinking of this small stuff, but the the stuff still applies. It uh, it just has to be condensed extremely because you're doing it in a much smaller storytelling format. And so here, you know, it's uh, the you know, we're 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 dissecting it, we're, we're dissecting kind of the joke, and I'm sorry if that removes the humor a bit, but that's what's going on here. So, we've got our Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3, our resolution outcome. Uh, you can also call this for, uh, since this is a humorous comic, we've got a setup. We've got a turning point. And we've got a punchline. And that's the comedic uh, structure. So that kind of lines up nicely with everything. So we've got our setup, so long pop I'm off to check my tiger trap, turning point. I'm sure to have gotten a tiger by now. Are you sure you've gotten a tiger? They really do like trainer fish. He's like, yes, they will do anything. And then Hobbs proves them right and says we're kind of stupid that way. So yeah, so there's kind of the structure of writing. So uh, one of the ways, like, if you're having trouble, um, let me go over this real quick. Oh, yep, appropriate comments here. Yep, so there's a setup, there's a turn, and there's a punchline in a, in a joke, in a, in a comedic structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no worries. No worries. <laughs> so uh, let me so let me show you uh, a kind of like paint by numbers story, right? So here is here is the paint by numbers or rather not so much the paint by numbers. Let's say it, let we'll just call it the fill in the e. we'll call it the fill in the blank story structure you start out with once upon a time and you fill it out with stuff this is where your act begins there's like once upon a time there was a character in a place and the setting and then two kind of expounding on the setting you fill out the sentence and every day so you start out with once upon a time there was a young farm boy uh, and every day he would farm the land uh, and and then there will be the turning point which will be act two which goes and you can think of this, think of it this way, until one day. Until one day something happens. Every day is the same until one day something's different. So you fill in the blanks until one day, fill in the blank there. And then, and then situation continues and es escalates. So, and because of that, so, so there's an inciting incident, and then something, beca and because of this inciting incident, our character decides to do something, or things fundamentally change into our character, our character is thrown into a new situation, uh, and they have to make new choices, and the drama has to escalate to a climax point. Uh, for for Act Three, right, and so and there and the and these can happen in a chain. So I do this one twice. And things can you know go on in this sentence like th and because of that this happens and because this happens because of that something else ha happens and this kind of continues in a in an escalating chain of events until you reach number six until finally 
uh, until finally there's a final confrontation, there's a, there's a battle, uh, and then there's the outcome of that battle, uh, and so forth. When, uh, I, I say battle, you know, it can be a conflict, it can be, you know, if the, if the stakes are super low, like, you know, it's, it's Calvin and Hobbes, he's setting up a, a trap for his, you know, stuffed tiger, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be a result of, of this in the, in the end, in the end of this. And then seven. And ever since. And ever since things from go to uh, a new state. So like this is the contrary to and every day. So every day things were one way, and then the and ever since things are a new way. Things are a different way because our hero has gained some experience, or gone through a change, or uh, experienced something tragic. You know this this can fit for a tragic tragic ending as well. So that's writing narrative structure. So that's kind of a that's kind of a fill in the blanks template. So uh, it's one that I that I super suggest going through. Um, it uh, it can help you establish that very very simple three act structure. So yeah, cool. All right. Next up, we're going to go over. Uh, let's see here. So we're going to discuss camera shots. So whenever you're these these panels are pictures, they're photographs basically, right? And depending on the type of story that you're telling will dictate what exactly shots you're going to take. So like most strip comics happen in like a medium a medium shot. And what that means typically is that there will be a character or two characters because it's fun when characters like bounce off of each other. A medium shot will be the two characters uh, typically from like either the knees up or the hips up because you want the action fairly close to them. You want to read some of their body language, but you also want to leave some space up here for your dialogue or your sound effects or something to happen. And you're going to have your background in there too. So they happen in, so typically they happen in medium shots and most uh, scenes in movies, you know, for example, are going to be medium shots because they're the characters interacting. Um, so yeah, so that's, those are, that's, that's the primary format that, that strip comics take, but they can also take, uh, any number of other camera shots. So I'll, I'll cover those with you. So I, uh, shorten this to, uh, ELS. It stands for extreme long shot. Alternatively, it's uh, establishing establishing long shot. We're establishing the area, right? We're saying our once upon a time, this is the place where we're at. So if you ever see like, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a comic or something and then it prominently fe features a building, you know, where we're fairly certain that something is going to happen in that building, right? With the next couple of, uh, of panel illustrations. So this can be called, and it's called an extreme long shot because if we see any people in it, they'll be typically small. We'll be able to see the full body. We'll be able to see like some action. So this is where they're at, you know, and we can say they're at a, a Walmart or something, you know, or, or, you know, 
whatever. This is an establishing shot. We're showing people where they're at. So it could be like the front of a store. It could be like their office space. It can be a number of things. So this, this can be uh, an ELS, again, stands for extreme long shot or establishing long shot. Uh, next type of picture. Yeah. So that's, that's called the extreme long shot. And if we've just got a long shot, what's typical about a long shot is that we'll be able to see the entire body of the person. And this is uh, useful for when you need to show a bit more context or around the people, or you need to show a bit more body language. So yeah, you're mostly gonna be using the medium shot typically for, for comics. Uh, extreme long shot, if you need to uh, set up things beforehand. This will typically be like panel one that you see in a, in a comic book or something like that. And it can happen in strip comic comics too if they need to establish where where someone is. But you don't typically see you, when you're when you're thinking of strip comics, you don't typically think of like oh you know they're they're gonna draw a building or they're gonna draw people on a boat. Like sometimes that happens. because the context is important to the story. But other times it's not. Sometimes it's just two people talking to each other. And so maybe our other, maybe we got another person. It's another two shot, but we can see like someone doing something with their hands. playing a game on their phone or something like that. Yeah, go away. All right, uh, next up, I will show the, ah yes, the insert. So an insert um, is usually a close up on some object, or perhaps it can be a letter that's important to the story. And then maybe like they're holding it. Yeah. They're holding it in their hands so that our audience can read this too. But yeah, so that'll be an insert. An insert is usually to show some super close up action uh, because it's important to the story. So yeah. Let me start a new layer. I can show you just a couple more. Yep, that's right. Yeah, uh, I like how um, the one of you put your your you're putting in your notes. Apples here put in the notes. That it's an ordinary world, and Act Two kind of throws them into the um, special world or something like that. And Act Three can be considered kind of a return to that. That's that's um, that's monomythic structure, in a, in a sense, um, because you've got you got the hero's journey. It's super cool. Like, there's all sorts of really cool stuff. Yeah, there's the ordinary world and the special world. Yeah, this is absolutely fantastic to go through this. And it's like a, it's like a clock, right? Because you start out with, like, your status quo and so forth. But yeah. Yep, and you can loop it. It can it can come back for, uh, for repeating things. Yeah, that's a really nice one. Uh, I, I really suggest looking up stuff like that. I've got uh, a couple video links I could... I could share that that explain it uh, quickly and succinctly but yeah so as far as camera shots I got a couple more for you uh, so that the insert the next is the CU close-up and the close-up will typically feature a person's like entire face um, that would be a little bit more extreme here you'll see like a bit of their their neck too in a close-up. If you're doing this for for comics, you could show someone uh, just their face, you know, if the reaction is super important. 
or uh, or super important to the story or super funny to the joke. Close up is good for that, for showing those facial reactions, like whatever they are. So you're going to be able to see details. So good for emotions. But yeah, so that that will be a close up, and there's um, the extreme close up. The ECU is the extreme version of that. And you show an extreme close up something. It's it's similar to an insert, but an extreme close up is usually set on the face, uh, and that'll be usually. Because something something super important is going on, like with their eyes, like they're suddenly looking aside. Whoops. And typically, with an extreme close up, if you're going to do su something like such a close look on the face, it's best to cut off portions of the top of the head and the bottom of the head. Because uh, otherwise showing like just the top of the head or just the the bottom of the head uh, can be can be a little disorienting you know as with all you know artistic rules and guidelines there there are spaces to keep them and there are spaces to break them but yeah so that's the extreme close-up it's an example of extreme close-up BEV stands for bird's eye view And the bird's eye view will typically show you like the tops of uh, the tops of buildings. So it's super important for like um, you know if you really need to see a lot of action from above. Uh, bird's eye views uh, can be uh, they can be the establishing shots too. The point is the camera or the observer is really high in the air. And something's going on. It's important for us to see the action. It's important for us to, to look down on the action. Important for the audience to look down on the action. Uh, or, you know, otherwise important to notice things that you might not otherwise see. Like... If it's super important that people understand it's a clear and sunny day, something like that. Kind of the childhood version of that, but you know, whatever. It's a sunny day. Sunshine. Go outside. After drawing your comic, of course. But yeah. So that's the bird's eye view. The opposite of that is the WEV or the worm's eye view. Typically things will be like shooting up in the distance. Like you're looking at this from a low angle. The building is super important or intimidating. Or it doesn't have to be a building. It can be like, it could be a person, you know? Could be a person who's like super intimidating, and you're seeing them from the from the underside because they're an imposing villain or authority figure, or heck, you know, it doesn't have to be villainous. You can make sure that like this is your your super heroic shot, like ah, oh, they're here to save the day, you know. So it's just something that like you're looking up at the person. or at the giant robot, or whatever. 
You can also ca alternatively call these like uh, uh, extreme down shots or up shots. You know, because it's super important to notice, like, the either either your figure is looking super heroic, or you need your audience to see the ceiling because there's a hole in it or something like that, and someone's about to jump through and down onto our hero or something like that. But yeah, so anytime information above is important worms eye view is not a bad choice anytime information below is important the birds eye view is uh, is a wonderful choice too so yeah cool uh, just a couple more yeah just a couple more so the next one OTS that's over the shoulder and you typically do an over-the-shoulder shot because you need the audience to see the same thing that your that your character is seeing right so that can be them like talking to another person uh, that could be a reason or they could be looking at like something in the distance Yeah, precisely. Fish and worms have you for for that uh, for that. But yeah, an over the shoulder shot shows you what your what your characters are looking at uh, from an objective point of view. And then there's actually the point of view shot, like you are the character looking at a thing. So like, um, and the over the shoulder can can lead directly into the point of view shot to where like if we have this beforehand and we have the same character afterwards we are now this character looking and talking at this person you know and they're looking directly at you and saying like hey you know it's nice to see you, you know. It can be something like very uh, personable. You know, if you need uh, your audience to see something that your character is seeing, that's when you enter, you know, the point of view shot. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and so, like, just as a general rule of thumb, if you're doing something, like, dramatic, it's nice to heighten the drama using some of these things, uh, very intentionally. You know, you're using your two-shot because it's important that two characters are here at the same time discussing this place. You, you, the establishing shot where they're doing it is important. The long shot, if, uh, body language or where people are in relationship to each other. This is again a place where like the, the background can be important. Insert if the character is like grabbing something, picking something up, or you know, you're just showing uh, something that's that's part of the scenery. Uh, it can also be a non sequitur, you know, like for whatever reason you're drawing a ladybug on a leaf that's not at all important to the story, but it's there and that's you needed to fill space or something like that. <laughs> But yeah, so when you're an artist, consider all of these shots. Like for now, if you're if you're if we're looking at this, for example, right? We can define what kind of shots these are. This is a medium two shot, right? We're seeing the guy from like either the knees above or the hip above, right? And we're seeing another character there. And then this could be considered a, a long shot because we're seeing the entire body of Calvin here. And then same you know, over here for Hobbs. Hobbs, it's kind of a long shot from the medium. So like. You know, we're we're outward. We see the the context. We're inward. We're looking at the character, um, or excuse me, we're we're kind of more inward here, but we still see some of the bit of the environment. And then we move out to kind of see the context of like what exactly is the hat and outfit that he's wearing here. 
and then we move back in to show uh, you know the, the the conflict of the story and then the the out shot again we can kind of see you know that there's even a variation in you know comedic storytelling here so yeah cool all right uh, next up I'm gonna cover lettering and for that I'm gonna bring up an example comic that I have here so I've set up kind of the example comic and whenever I've uh, if if I've drawn something I, I establish a character and I need to make sure that I leave space for word bubbles and if they're gonna get like additional things there so this is an important part of lettering is making sure that you have space for everything and then I've decided that there's gonna be a big sound effect or something going on right here so I need to make sure that I've that I've lab that I've labeled that out and that the that the word is legible and maybe in kind of an interesting shape too that way we can put the letters out I've decided over here I'm gonna letter vertically so I'm gonna be this way and then there's gonna be another return over back here to a medium shot But yeah, so an important part of lettering, uh, and you can do this by hand. Uh, if you are going to do, do it by hand, I suggest using a consistent set of guides. So I'm grabbing some guides and I'm dragging them down over the word balloon, just to make sure that I'm spacing things evenly. Or just so that I have some reference point. Because if I am going to hand letter, then uh, then it's best to make sure that I've got that and uh, I can hop straight into inks you know and write something uh, oops I was following the guides too closely If you're gonna do it by by hand, you know, um, establish some consistent like spacing or or um, uh, 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 something like that, so that when you are hand lettering, it comes out consistent and legible. Another good thing to keep in mind is like whenever you're making like a word balloon, the the words within the balloon need space to breathe. So you make sure that there's kind of like breathing space around your words and it's a it's a legibility thing it just makes it's just one of those things that gets your comic looking very nice very professional and if you're adding the word balloon tails here um, the you you try and want the tails to point like specifically at the mouth of the person if they're gonna have their mouth open while they're speaking usually it's kind of frustrating when like you're you've drawn someone when I see that someone's drawing a comic there's a word balloon and then the person who's in the comic has their mouth closed but yeah and then if you're going to if you're going to do it by a font that can make sure that things are perfect already uh, and then if you're going to do like tip my my typical mode of operating modus operandi is uh, I will letter like 
words and captions and stuff uh, with with the fonts and then I will hand letter sound effects because I want them to have like a certain look they need to be a little bit more illustrated and they'll typically be like block letters that's a very bad block letter M but you get my point there's gonna be some body to the hand lettered stuff yeah so those are some tips when it comes to lettering always make sure that you have space for whatever you've written in your story um, and this is a good point when drawing drawing comics is a is is a good exercise in making sure that your words add to the picture or uh, add to the story in some way um, because it's a uh, it can it can be a little boring and come off a little dull if your characters are just restating what's happening in the picture so they should be you know like here I didn't write this beforehand so I'm doing the same thing like sure is a good thing my computer's in perfect working edition boom because the computer lights on fire he's got a reaction like and then resolution there's something finally happening so yeah alright uh, let's see here I think that covers most of my notes yeah lettering by hand um, or use fonts basically the point is to ensure consistency and make sure that your uh, writing uh, lettering is legible is one legible to add something to the the story so that's a consideration that you kinda take backwards into your writing process or if you've done like I am like I haven't written this comic yet so like I just kinda drew out a scenario so that's one of the things where like uh, maybe I don't need four lines of dialogue here maybe I could do it in three something a little less on the nose But yeah, all right, um, yeah, that takes up most of uh, most of the time. Yeah, does uh, does anyone have any questions? I'm like, uh, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna cover um much as far as like publishing, but there are multiple websites out there. You can share them to social media. Um, you know, if you share something out to your your Twitter, you know that you that you did randomly and it gets a bunch of likes or something, that could be a, a clue that like, hey, you're onto something good. You know, maybe maybe set up something on a more uh, on a site a little more oriented towards like web comics or something like that. With print, there are different considerations as well, but yeah. So, uh, any questions? or comments or anything like that that's fine sorry if this is something for another day yeah that's fine could you explain how the frame of a comic affects the way the comic is read oh um yeah so uh, no yeah yeah no that's a good that's a good question um, whenever you're laying out uh, and this and this is something that that pertains to, to lettering too whenever you're laying out a comic uh, you definitely want to make sure that you have 
uh, reading that you give some consideration to reading direction. So typical reading direction for English is going to be you're going to move from your top uh, right uh, left to right top to bottom so like this direction and then this direction typically uh, so if you're going to have your letters at a, at a weird slant like this maybe this is not the best uh, slant to have these letters on so you can consider that like oh my reading direction is actually going the opposite this way so maybe instead what I want it is to go down this way and then this one can come back to kind of like uh, and since it's going to be read upwards it'll lead back up here you know so like yeah that those those are those are definitely considerations to to take into play uh read a readability of uh of your comic but yeah so that's that's in consideration um another consideration i think that's that's encompassed by that where can you learn more about storytelling? So uh, my primary resource for storytelling is Robert McKee's book, Story. It is the Bible of storytelling. And it, and it, um, it primarily addresses screenplays, uh, but it, it applies to everything. Everything in that, in, in that book, like, it, it, uh, like the, he takes movies and uses those as the as the medium for like oh here's how a story is told yep that's it that's it robert mckee's story that thing is so like it's it it can be intimidating because it is thick and it is dense every time i have read this book though i come up you know having been reminded of something new or something useful and this book will ex and that book will explain like um arch plots uh, subplots, non-plot type of stuff, and and go over examples. That's a fantastic uh, reference for for storytelling. It's something that I would recommend you get a copy of. Like, you know, rent it out. You know, th take it from the library if your library's got a copy, right? To just check it out if you want to just check it out, or like, if you've got a nerdy friend like me who uh, has the book. Unfortunately, I don't have the book. Like this is one of those books where I'm like, "Oh God, I love this book," but it's not on my shelf. <laughs> but yeah, I have read it multiple times, and it's uh, it's really good. It's super dense on like um, tips for for writing in story structure, you know. And and it doesn't matter what type of story that you're trying to tell, whether it be a tragic or a comedic story, you know. Those those will th those will apply. So yeah. Um. Yeah, uh, the, to return to the, uh, the, the other question about the, uh, how the frame of the comic affects readership. Um, uh, not, not affects readership, but affects the, the way that it's read. So there are all sorts of interesting... Like another a book that's specifically good for uh, comics is Understanding Comics by uh, Scott McCloud? Uh, something McCloud. I need to look that up, but um, yeah, it's it's called uh, Understanding Comics. He's got it's it's actually a series of books. So there's Understanding Comics and then Making Comics, and the books themselves are comic books. Uh, it's super cool, and it will it will explain stuff like uh, like I've explained here. So um, the so speaking speaking specifically to like uh, panel shape and direction. You know, if you're laying out stuff sequentially for a strip comic like this, pretty obviously the, that the reading direction is going to uh, kind of restart for every panel. They'll go, you know, top, they'll go left to right, top to bottom, uh, top, top to bottom, left to right, top to bottom, left to right, you know, and, and so forth. Uh, but there are ways that uh, are really cool in like a in like comics as a storytelling because it's a visual medium you can lead the eyes uh, to other places and one of the one of the coolest uh, things that that you can do uh, is if you lead the readers eye well enough you can make them read stuff backwards uh, and it's absolutely amazing when this is pulled off right it can be an uh, it can also be a train wreck if you do it the wrong way so 
you know, practice. Uh, but the, those th things like that come with practice. Um, but yeah, so like if it, when it comes to like laying out a page, where you put your panels uh, affects your readability. So like if you've got, uh, if you've broken stuff up into even panels, that's fairly easy to read because it, it goes from, from there, there, and there. Uh, alternatively, a bad comic layout, or one that I've found that I don't necessarily suggest, like maybe it could work in some, some instances, uh, but using, uh, using panels that go like this, which direction is the person supposed to go next? Are they supposed to go uh, right, or are they supposed to go down? So, like, sometimes it can work if the content itself is is compositionally geared to point down or this way. And, you know, the lazy way that I've so seen some people do it when they've laid out a comic like this is to literally lay the arrows on the page, you know, and tell the reader where to go, which is... Uh, it, I don't know. It can work for some comics, like something that's like... Uh, that is like self that is comedic maybe and self-aware that it is a comic can get away with something like that a bit more but if you want to do something like dramatic and really draw someone in uh, you typically want to avoid stuff like that because you don't know if the, whether they're going to read it like this or like this so typically when you're laying out comics don't stack them on the left so like I'll just write that out big letters don't stack on <laughs> the left as a broadly thing you know like if you're you know if you're absolutely brilliant in laying out the composition in a way you can break this rule but generally don't stack on the left so yeah all right um yeah that's as for yeah this is it scott mcleod Yep, that's good. Yeah, absolutely. You can have the... Yes, so you can have the bubbles cross the lines, or you can have a, a character... You can do a breakaway panel, where, like, a character is, like, um, you know, like, reaching down or something like that through a panel. Like, those are those are acceptable, like, kind of ways of, of leading uh, a person's eye. But generally try to make sure that you're doing it for a reason. You know, and not just because, like, oh, I was laying out my comics and forgot to not stack on the left for this one. You know, so I'm just throwing a cheap trick in here. Like, like don't try, try not to do that. But, like, you know, I'm not I'm not the boss of you. So, like, if you want to do it that way, you can do it that way. But just, that's a general, like, pet peeve of mine is, like, people stacking things on the left and, like, confuses me about which order re to read stuff in especially if it's not thought out compositionally. But yeah. Unless you're writing manga. Yeah, if you're if you're writing manga, um I don't I don't really get people's like writing English comics in manga format backwards like that doesn't really make sense to me. Like I, it makes sense if you're if you're reading manga from Japan to 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 be trained in a different reading order because that's true to the artist's original t intentions, but like generally, yeah. I mean, you know, people are going to do things how they want to do things. If you want to draw stuff in the manga format and if you find an audience like you know, best of luck to you. I'm not I'm it's going to it's going to bug the heck out of me if I know you're an English speaker and I know you wrote your comic in manga format. That's going to bug me a bit, but you know, whatever. People do people do what they do. All right, um yeah, there are other uh th those are good resources to kind of look at in general, but uh yeah, I'm going to wrap up this uh this stream. All right, uh, thanks so much for sticking with me, everybody. Uh, you can feel free to stick around afterwards. I'll field questions, uh, and I can offer uh, critique or, or extra tips. Uh, I might return to that question earlier about um, uh, the, way, the way panels are shaped affecting reading a little bit more. I'll go a little more into detail there. 
uh, but just not in the YouTube video. So I'm going to wrap it up for now. Thank you so much for joining me, uh, especially the you viewers on YouTube. If you like what you see, you know, drop me a subscription, uh, like the video or whatever. Do the YouTube things. Uh, and have a good day for the YouTube viewers. Bye. For the rest of you, I'll continue to see you.